Thank you. Welcome everyone to Gallery Ortiz. We are so happy to see familiar faces and welcome new ones. We are here this afternoon, which is a very, very special afternoon for us. Uh, we have Dr. Jolie Spicer from the Walters Museum. And we'd like to welcome her as our guest, and this is the first time she's presenting here at Gallery Mertiz. So a little bit of background on the exhibition that's currently installed here, and then I'll read Dr. Spicer's bio, and then she's going to do a lovely presentation on the exhibition at the Walters, which is revealing the African presence in Renaissance Europe, and talk about the parallels between that exhibition and ours, which is revealing the African presence in Renaissance Europe, the contemporary response. And in our exhibition, we are featuring the works of eight contemporary artists who are influenced by, inspired by, and responding to the imagery and subject matter that's touched upon in the Walters exhibition. And I liken it to the tradition of African music, where the spirits of our ancestors have been sent forth, this call and response, and the contemporary artists are responding to the imagery, the spirits of their ancestors. And in talking about and informing you of Dr. Iser's uh, bio and past, she is a recipient of the B her BA from Smith College and PhD from Yale University. After teaching at the University of Toronto, she came to the Walters in 1990. Her publications have addressed such wide-ranging subjects as Neverlandish painting in Dutch and Flemish drawings from the National Gallery of Canada, Art and Science at the Court of the Rudolf II in Prague, and the role of the visitor in 17th century art collections and in modern exhibitions. To all of you, I would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Spicer. So I'm uh, really delighted. Is this is uh, level about right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to uh, be here. Uh, this show, revealing the African presence in Renaissance Europe, I, I started actually around uh, 2000, 2001, uh, trying to think whether or not you, you know really becoming interested in this subject. Um, and uh, oh, I'm supposed to be standing up on this spot. Yes, 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 I have to follow instructions here. Um, uh, and uh, begin to think whether or not um, I could um, uh, do an exhibition on this subject because there really had not been a one before. There was a number of scholars who worked in this area uh, coming out of uh, European sort of Renaissance uh, studies. Uh, but there had never been an exhibition, and there were many factors that would um, uh, influence that decision, that there were many sort of difficulties, challenges involved with this, not only in finding the material, but when I started working on the subject, trying to propose something inside the Walters, and then um, uh, it took me a long time to sort of get it on the books, and then uh, to try to place the show elsewhere, um, encountering a, a, a variety of sort of, uh, of difficulties. So um, it's uh, it's it's uh, wonderful, absolutely wonderful uh, for me uh, that we are um, that the, the the show has uh, opened, that it actually opened, it actually happened. Um, and that it has been um, a success, and I, I can't, I, I'm sorry, I can't help myself, you'll have to indulge me for a second, in case you haven't seen it, um, that um, we got a review on the New York Times, on the, you know, above the fold, um, on the uh, Friday market. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know, that, I'm sure sometime in, in history there has been a better review than this, but, but it's, uh, so you know all the, the, the all the difficulties that I encountered. Um, I you know that's why I take special satisfaction uh, uh, in uh, the response uh, that uh, scholars and audiences have have had to this uh, show. And and I think an important part of that in terms of response is that um, I, I think the just as um, uh, the the success with which um, Amy and uh, uh, Mertice have uh, encouraged artists to respond uh, to this show. Also, um, I think a very wide range of people respond in their own way. You know, this. They may not be artists, 
uh, but they are responding and um, uh, associating it with their own lives in one way or the other. That's really what we hope exhibitions do. You know, that, that great artists, when you're looking at great art of the, uh, of the past, uh, that um, uh, what becomes important is not just because, okay, that's pretty, that's well done, but, but whether it somehow enlarges you you know, in, in, in some ways or other. And, and that's what we hope for um, as a museum. And, and also to keep in mind, you know, one of those periods so-called the, the Renaissance um, in Europe, it's, it's a period um, that's, that's quite important um, in European history uh, in, in many ways and continues to be important in American society. And one aspect of it, you know, it, Renaissance is simply, as I'm sure you're aware, just means rebirth. And, and after all, what it involved, just as um, we are, you know, surrounded by examples uh, here today. Is it, it involved in a very fundamental way, looking back to another um, a vital, um, a creative period in the past, and drawing on that. In other words, stepping back in order to leap forward, mm -hmm. um, to to understanding the roots um, in order to blossom, as it were. And I think um, that in an exhibition like this, you, this is just such a perfect example of how so much of the much of the great art of the past um, has been uh, generated. You don't do everything absolutely new um, by drawing on the uh, past. The all the resonances of the that art of the past um, is now sort of absorbed um, in, into what you're doing. You're adding a new uh, a new chapter to a uh, a great work of art. You know, so so so. Um, uh, uh, artists such as Albrecht Durer or, or Veronese or any of the artists in our show are, in, in some sense, expanded by a contemporary response today. We understand them better, and I, I say that very specifically because there are uh, a number of works in this show that my own understanding of them, I can, I can tell you, has been expanded by seeing how artists and other people today respond to them, that they see something slightly different than what I had seen. Um, uh, yes, maybe we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, oh, wait a minute, where's my little clicker? Here. Oops. Uh, one of the basic principles um, in this show uh, is uh, sort of in, uh, embedded in the very first work that you encounter when uh, you visit the show, and I and I think uh, many of you have uh, seen uh, seen the show. And that here, this is a traditional uh, subject in European art of that period, a uh, Christian art of that period, which is the adoration of the uh, of the kings, um, and which you see at this period uh, this uh, growing importance um, uh, of uh, devotional art of really making clear the universal nature uh, of the Christian uh, mission, and therefore. Um, including uh, an Af one African king as well as a European and, a, and an Eastern uh, king, uh, but more important even for for us, you know, in, in within this exhibition, and that is not seeing the black king as simply okay, this is a stock figure, so now we're going to have an African, um, we're going to include an African quote unquote um, uh, among those uh, worshiping the Christ child, but this is a portrait. Just like this is a portrait, so is this, the black king's uh, attendance. And it's been done on the basis of a careful study uh, from life. So that what we know, if we look beyond, if you see the painting, not simply as a surface, but as a window uh, on the past, and you look through that um, to the individuals depicted, that we can uh, begin to much more surely than we have in the past, um, speak directly uh, to these people who lived 500 years ago and begin to tease out something more about their presence, their, their ambitions, their contributions to society, and also we will see uh, what is reflected very much, I think, in, at least in uh, some artists' works in, in this show, uh, something trying to understand something of their emotional life. I always want to say next, but of course that's instructions to me. <laughs> um, 
Uh, this show is divided into uh, two parts, and, and I'm going to focus primarily on, on one part, but I want to look um, at the uh, first part um, uh, also, which is the, the first part is sort of contacts. At the Walters, we always do contacts. We're a big contacts um, institution, um, uh, looking at the social, historical, etc. conditions that surround uh, the making of uh, works of art so that we place them in, in history. Um, and so the first half of this show is on that sort of context, the context for people of African ancestry um, in, uh, in Europe. And then the second half is focusing on uh, the people themselves. And so the, the exhibition begins, the first section here is on the perceptions of Africa um, in Europe um, at this period for sort of the long 16th century from the late 15th into the early uh, 17th, 17th century. And what we find here, because after all, one's own sense of self is very much influenced by how other people see you. It's, 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 it cannot really be uh, avoided, or you're a remarkable individual if you are not uh, influenced that, by that. So, so we want to, to, to think about that a bit. And what we find is, and certainly in perceptions of Africa, um, that um, uh, Africa was so immense, um, close, geographically in some ways, but so so, so strange uh, to Europeans that we see the kind of ambivalence of this um, in the um, uh, in the art of the uh, in the art of the, the, the time. Uh, for instance, in this uh, allegory of Africa, uh, the figure of Africa, it's a very common way at the time to show a female figure as a kind of embodiment uh, of a uh, concept, and then surrounded by attributes or things that, that um, enlarge the image. And here she is uh, riding on a crocodile. Well, the crocodile was in a way one of those images associated with Africa at this period. Uh, something um, so terrifying, uh, so threatening. Um, and you know, you don't, you, you don't tame a crocodile. You know, there are many other things. You, you can get an elephant to work for you. You can do all kinds of things with all kinds of other uh, animals, but not a crocodile, you know? And so the, the idea of this, um, the, the sometimes terrifying character uh, of this immense uh, uh, continent, the vastness of the uh, Sahara, um, of the intensity of the heat, uh, these are things that were quite hard to, uh, to grasp. But the, also, at the very same time, and even in this text, it contrasts the issue of the, 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 you know, the, the wildness of the continent with its history, with the concept of the, the incredible technical achievements uh, of the uh, pyramids uh, with which uh, Africa was also associated, so that you would see these two dramatically different um, sides, of the, uh, sides of the continent. We also have, um, at this time, another uh, fundamental aspect of this context would it be uh, the importance of the roles of, uh, played by Africans in Christian art uh, of this period. And that really does not play a, a role in, this, um, uh, in the exhibition here, so I'm not really going to uh, uh, focus on that much, except to say uh, that uh, besides, you know, sort of a, we can say very basically that the roles played by uh, Africans in Christian art of the Renaissance is basically the same range as in society itself, which is to say from ruler uh, to servant, the full range, much like everybody else. Um, very fascinating. I mean, there's a lot of things that are quite interesting here. Not everybody um, I um, discover uh, knows about um, St. Morris, um, who was a, you know, the, the very idea of the, the um, importance of the black saint um, at this figure in Europe, the, uh, uh, period in Europe. So there's a lot that's new uh, here, but this is not really uh, relevant for, for, for us. Um, another basic issue here, which is relevant for us, is the question of color. Um, in the Renaissance, uh, we, we commonly talk about race today. Um, and race was, there was the word race, in, in, uh, certainly in French, um, at that time, but it meant like family, like the race of Henry VIII, King Henry VIII or something like that. It would be the family. Uh, it, didn't, it wasn't associated with ethnicity. Um, so we have just used the word color um, in, the, uh, in the show because that's how um, they uh, would talk about these issues. And color 
um, has two sides at this period. On the one, um, as you would be might expect, um, there, there is certainly uh, a very strong element of color as a source of prejudice. Uh, and um, one of those, and what we try to do in the show is get those out and look at them. What actually was wrong with black skin? What, why, why would you have prejudice against black skin? Um, uh, and um, because so often a, a prejudice is one of those things that simply perpetuates itself and nobody remembers why? why. Why did you dislike this family or something? Nobody remembers. It just goes on generation after generation after generation. So we just wanted to go back and, 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 and look at it. Well, there's some very fundamental things at this, this period um, that it's good to get out and look at, and sometimes many of them will, <laughs> will really make you mad. Uh, but, but there it is. So let's just, uh, one of the basic uh, elements of this is it's a complete misunderstanding of skin pigment. Um, the assumption in Europe that Adam and Eve were white. Therefore, if human beings were originally white, it means anybody who is not white that is discolored, as they would have said. Well, of course, that makes no sense at all to, to us today, but that was a kind of fundamental uh, assumption. Well, if you believe that, many things will follow uh, from that. Um, even the word Ethiopian um, is uh, basically Greek for burnt, for burnt uh, uh, skin. So there's always the assumption that it started out white. We can only get back to white. Um, There's another basic sort of element here that influences many other aspects of the issue of, uh, of prejudice, and that is Genesis. In Genesis, um, the first day of creation, which is what is depicted in this uh, print, which is uh, in the show, um, uh, as you will uh, recall, uh, what, does, what does God do on the first day? He separates light from dark. Um, and light is associated with illumination, um, uh, dark uh, with, with, with night, uh, with, with ignorance, with chaos, out of which uh, light uh, will uh, emerge, and from chaos to ignorance of God, um, and uh, it's a slippery slope. Uh, to um, hell, Hades and hell being black, sin being black, um, and uh, it keeps going. Um, and so what starts out as a symbol uh, sticks, you know, um, and it, it's a kind of, um, it's, it's very dispiriting uh, to see this, but, but there it is. Um, but just at the same time, and there are many other manifestations of that, but there, but at the same time, one of the things that's so fascinating about this period, which is um, when there is so much sort of exchange and people just looking at things in sort of new and completely open uh, ways, and that is um, the development of a black aesthetic um, in the uh, 1500s. It's something that I find absolutely fascinating and one of the, the aspects of all of this in which um, I have made uh, more of a contribution myself uh, to the scholarly uh, literature. Um, and that um, up until this time, it's been very popular uh, for, um, uh, in the, at the beginning of this period, for collectors. And now you have more people actually having art in their homes than you had before. It's not just religious, you have it, uh, have it in, your, uh, in your home. And you, you see um, that one of the things that they're collecting are um, uh, creating our small sort of uh, statuettes or fig figurines and bronze and different, different materials that are meant to, in some ways, look back to classical antiquity. So it's part of that Renaissance idea that they're, that they're trying to be like a Roman collector. Well, one of the aspects of that is that within this, uh, within this group now, you begin to see many artists who naturally work with bronze or black marble or other dark materials who have just naturally thought of these as absolutely fabulous colors. But you know, the black is a great, if you work in mar black marble, it's a great material, or onyx, etc. Begin now uh, to want to express this, express the aesthetic um, achievement of this material through the depiction of African uh, figures. So that we now have, along with such works like this, this is in the Walters uh, collection, you begin now to have um, a whole range of other uh, figures that are now um, of, uh, of Africans. Um, so this is a very a, a 
exciting uh, uh, development at this, uh, at this period. And it, it involves a kind of reassessment in some ways uh, of blackness, uh, which is quite exciting, in which you will people see begin to really to think as well, uh, to, to think very directly about um, the aesthetic possibilities or, or just think of blackness as an aesthetic choice. Um, and uh, um, also at this time, we want to, we need to think of, uh, briefly about the situation of, uh, of social class um, and, and slavery. Uh, something to keep in mind, because that's always in people's minds with, with the background in American history, and that is um, to think that at the beginning of the period we're concerned with, in the beginning of the 15th century, um, sure, um, all, all countries in the Med around the Mediterranean are all basically slaves economies. They all have uh, slaves. Uh, but in Europe, most of the slaves are white um, at this period. Uh, there, um, there's a reason why slave and slob <coughs> sound very similar, uh, because most of the slaves are Russian or from the from the from the east, um, and only gradually over time, uh, with the um, increased trade, the Portuguese trade down the west coast of Africa, uh, does that um, expand that and to include uh, more uh, more more Africans? Um, we also have a situation in Europe that it's basically an urban uh, phenomenon. Um, it is not the plantation. We don't have plantations um, in Europe at this time. Um, so you are uh, basically learning skills um, in the household or working um, in a shop, uh, in a shop. And um, the, the uh, bondage is basically a fairly negotiable uh, situation because um, very few people uh, are not manument, are not free during their lifetime. So uh, money is set aside. You start your own business or whatever, um, and uh, go, you know, uh, merge into society um, as a whole. Uh, and this painting done in Lisbon in the 16th century, um, Lisbon had the highest population of uh, people of African uh, origin in Europe. That was. 10% of the population, which is quite a striking uh, number. And in this quite remarkable painting uh, from around the 1560s, this is a part of the uh, city near the uh, port and the area where people went to get water. Um, uh, because you didn't have water piped into your houses, mostly you went to public fountains and you uh, bought, got your water there. But in any case, in this, uh, in this painting, um, about 30% of the people are black. Uh, which is a quite a remarkable um, uh, view of European uh, urban society uh, that's, uh, I think, quite uh, striking to many visitors. And one of the things that we find that people are in all different walks of life, um, doing all kinds of things. Um, uh, some of them uh, seem to be clearly sort of enslaved, uh, but others are those we have Sailors, black sailors on shore leave, etc. And we also have this person who I her urge you to look more closely at when you are um, at the Walters, which I assume you will be um, again. And um, this man, we can identify him, although I can never remember his name myself because I'm not very good at Portuguese names. But in any case, he rose from being a slave at court uh, to being a noble. He's a nobleman. He's a member of the uh, Order of St. James, which we can tell um, by the insignia on his, uh, on his cape. So that we have a remarkable um, uh, a range of, um, not only of occupations, but interactions uh, between, uh, between groups um, in that society. We have very few representations of what we would think of as people enslaved, because Europeans weren't really into that particularly, but why um, it, it wasn't really a, an issue. Um, they were more concerned with the issue of potential being enslaved themselves, um, because you might be, uh, if you were captured on the high seas uh, by a North African uh, slave trader, uh, you were going to end up um, uh, on the market um, in Algiers. That's what you would be afraid of. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's very interesting that the most images of somebody who is actually in chains, um, they're white. Uh, like Michelangelo bound slaves. Because that represented European fears. 
Uh, the, actually, the most famous person from this period who narrowly escaped being sent to the galleys to die as a galley slave uh, was the uh, Spanish writer Cervantes, who was captured on the high seas and, and ransomed at the last moment. But he languished in Algiers for some time before he escaped. But in any case, let's keep moving, moving along. But one of the things I wanted to show here, this little head, which is in the show, which is only like this big, but one of the striking things about uh, this, as well as many other uh, representations in the show, is um, the expression. Um, it's small, so you have to, you know, look at him. You have to really to engage with him. You you have to get you have to really get close, which I urge you to do. And that is um, that you will see that in so many of these representations, the the artist has been so insistent to bring out a sense of the reality and the personality of the person who's who who was the model uh, for this image, um, and the sense of a kind of sadness, a kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to actually, there, there are many ways that one might uh, imagine, but, but a kind of ambivalent expression in their face of, of what's going to happen to me, um, where am I going, um, and thinking where have I been. Um, this is, is absolutely um, a very striking element uh, of these, which I encourage you to look at um, uh, in the show. Uh, we have um, one uh, section then as we move into the people themselves, we begin with people uh, who are depicted as slaves. Um, and the, we know that at this period it became, as portraiture became more and more important, which is after all kind of defining quality of this new uh, focus on the individual uh, that the Renaissance is known for. Um, one of the ways as people try to think of all different ways to, to depict their status, is that if you were quite wealthy, you might decide at this period to show yourself either with, I don't know, some kind of prized, you know, your prized hunting dog um, or your children, but you might also show up with a black sled as a, as a high, oops, see, what am I doing? Um, uh, as a very high status uh, 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 symbol. Um, and the uh, poster girl for this show, this uh, fabulous uh, portrait here, um, this is, was originally part of a portrait like that, but the woman here who would have been um, her, her mistress, the, the, the owner, um, here you see just her veil and her arm, um, she's been lost. The picture must have been damaged at some point in the past and had to be cut down. And all that remains is this absolutely fabulous uh, portrait um, of, uh, of her, her, her servant, uh, shown here holding up this um, really very expensive clock. So um, the woman was being known by her uh, possessions, including uh, this fabulous clock. Well, one of the things about this is this whole question uh, that is this raises um, uh, Let's just go to the next one here again. One of the questions raises, one of the issues raised by one of the artists in the show, I think in a very uh, fascinating way, and, and I never can quite remember the names. Uh, I remember the works of art better than the, the names, I'm sorry to say. But the, the series that this uh, uh, represents, you don't want to tell me? It's actually part of her Black on Black series. Yes. It's Jamia Richmond Edwards, and it's right. an untitled piece. Right. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the whole issue of uh, invisibility, uh, which I can see some of you uh, nodding here, is this, this question of uh, people who seem to, to who, who live their lives um, uh, in the shadow of others, you know, and how do we tease them out? Um, have we done that to people? And, and she, uh, she told me the whole story uh, behind her, the series that she did, which I will attempt to uh, completely sort of retell. Uh, but it had to do partly with her. Oh, sorry. Oh, and I'm walking away. Um, <laughs> um, uh, with her own family history of how she felt that she had, in some degree, uh, written her own mother out um, and uh, sort of acted as if she was uh, invisible because her life, the, the, the path her mother had taken didn't really, you know, fit her idea of 
where she herself wanted to be. Um, and, and the fate of, of many black women um, in, the, in the past. They were, the, some of the, the women in this uh, series have actually uh, been killed by a serial killer. Um, and nobody, they've been um, uh, prostitutes and nobody cared about them. You know, and she wanted to, to draw them out and sort of memorialize them, but also emphasize, mix that issue of invisible, social invisibility with the issue of black as invisible. <coughs> and, and I personally think these are really fabulous. This is a fabulous, fabulous uh, series because how she has drawn these various issues together with such incredible success um, is to me uh, absolutely uh, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, technology is not um, what I do with that. Okay, okay. okay back here. Um, and um, uh, this um, um, makes me think uh, absolutely, and, and also these women's faces, because these are based on photographs that were taken. They were mud shots when the women were arrested. You know, they were killed later, but she went back and got their mug shots mm -hmm. from when they had been arrested. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's incredibly subtle um, and 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 wonderful what she did. Uh, but I'm reminded then very much, aside from these uh, commissioned portraits, like somebody very wealthy who commissions themselves with a richly dressed black child. Um, uh, that the drawings, however, aside from those commissions, these same artists were doing drawings themselves that were only for their purposes. They weren't for anybody else's purposes. They can draw what they want. Um, and the incredibly sensitive drawings uh, that they are doing. This drawing uh, by Albrecht Durer, who is one of the great portraitists of the uh, Renaissance, a German artist. Um, th this drawing has probably never been in the Western Hemisphere before. Um, and after the showing in Baltimore, it will not go to Princeton, to our uh, partner in the show. It will go back to the Uffizi, to, to Florence again. So it's a, one of the great Renaissance portrait drawings. Um, but aside from the absolute beauty of his uh, execution and the way that he has again used that black or brown material uh, to play with lines in order to try to understand the aesthetic, the, the forms of her uh, uh, forms of her face. What's the most striking is his respect mm -hmm. for her facial expression. He doesn't try to make her look happy, go lucky. You know, he, he doesn't try that, doesn't do that at all. He absolutely respects this sense of kind of resignation and sadness in, in her face, uh, which I think is, uh, which, which really, you know, I, I really see a connection uh, with these. And this is a person also uh, who was in service in bondage um, in, uh, in, in Antwerp where the artists uh, visited. Um, and again, would be one of the invisible. Um, except that Durer then, through this drawing, it's not just that it's a great drawing, uh, but you know, it establishes her as a person living in Antwerp. You know? A place, I might add, where they didn't actually have the concept of slavery. So if she, which she probably didn't know, if she had gone AWOL, she would not have to have gone back. The, her honor could not have gotten her back, but she probably didn't know. We have a famous case of someone there who did go AWOL, um, and the owner tried to get him back, and the court system said, we don't have slavery here. Um, we allowed you to bring in slaves, these are Portuguese merchants, we allowed you to bring in slaves, because that was the only basis on which you were going to come, and we wanted your trade connections, um, but um, uh, uh, we are not going to guarantee your ownership. But she probably didn't know that. Um, the, the, one of the sections that I was most interested in myself um, was the a section on free and freed people of African ancestry. What happens when people make their, start shaping their own life? Uh, one of the things that I'm very interested in and keeps coming up um, uh, time and time again with so many different artists uh, here in the show is how do we present ourselves? Uh, what choices do we make? when we define ourselves in terms of an uh, image. If you are in bondage, or if you are trying to integrate into a uh, social group, 
um, you, you, you either don't have any choice um, or you're going to try to look like people around you. But as you may sort of move up, as we will see in this show, move up the social chain here, um, you begin to have many more choices. What choices did they make? Um, and um, here we have a whole range of people that we think we, how important that the art may be, we'll find, in terms of sort of teasing out the, the, the presence. Oh, some artist here was talking about absence and black absence. I forget who it was in one of these very nice little artist uh, statements. And, and I thought, oh, what a nice, if I'd only thought of that myself. Uh, because we talk about the presence. The, Af the, the, the African presence in Renaissance Europe. But it might have been very interesting to talk, to make a play on absence versus presence. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very interesting that the artist picked, picked up on that. When are you both absent and present? Mm -hmm. You know, you can be both at the same time. You, you can be present but feel absent. You know? um, and there can be times when you're absent but other people feel your presence. You know? so, so these concepts um, can, uh, can flow back and forth. But one of the things that we will uh, find to make a, uh, to, to, to not spend too much time on, the, on the, uh, some aspects of this, and that is that it was an incredible rage, that we are finding them um, uh, in, in the countryside. Uh, we are finding them um, or their, their descendants as, as artists, um, as uh, a whole range of different uh, sort of occupations, as teachers, um, as uh, scholars, um, as uh, people who have chosen the religious life, as Franciscans, etc. Uh, we are also finding them as very wealthy, very successful individuals. And maybe yet we haven't been able to fully clarify their lives, but through their image, we can, we're, we're beginning to, to do so. And then, of course, one of the figures in the show, and I'm just seeing that this display makes everybody look a little fatter and a little shorter uh, than they are. So you have to imagine everybody's a little bit taller and a little bit narrow, narrower than they depict here. Um, Al Alessandro de' Medici, um, uh, Duke of Florence, uh, which is, after all, quite a nice gig. <laughs> um, one of the artists, at least one, maybe more than one, was very interested in this portrait here, you see, which I mentioned before, a painting, one of those that was totally unknown before this exhibition, never published before, I found in a private collection in, in Belgium, um, and is absolutely riveting to me because uh, both in this a gold chain, which would be, you don't commission a chain like that. That's given to you um, as, an, as an expression of high court service. You know? um, so you wear it with great honor because there's only one way to get that. You know? um, his uh, cap here, that's the kind of cap that I mean, houses are cold then. Um, and so you might wear your furs inside, but you also, men might wear a cap also uh, because it's cold. Um, in, in Northern Europe, and um, if you're quite wealthy, like his cap here, you will see it with the little seed pearls. It's, it's all covered with little seed pearls. Um, so everything we know about him is found in this portrait. We don't have any other document. Uh, I think my point of interest was him. I was so proud of when I felt like, okay, I think maybe I have found him in another work of art, um, in a, um, a tapestry, uh, that represents a wedding um, at a, um, uh, the, the court uh, of one of the uh, dukes of, of Saxony. Um, and the figure here um, that is represented would be in the position that looks like he would be court chamberlain or something like that. In other words, the person who sort of organizes the court, keeps everything uh, working and, 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 and running, um, a very high a very high position, but the kind of position within a court system that, that it's, it's in the court system where blacks were most likely to rise because they might not have, um, if they had been enslaved at some point in their life, they probably don't have the same kind of education that they would have had otherwise. But in the court, where there are lots of jobs that, that involve really good organizational skills, loyalty, and persistence, and, and intelligence, and if you have all that, um, it's very possible for you to rise, uh, for anybody who is maybe from a disadvantaged background,
to rise in a uh, in a court system. So that's really one of the places that we we find them. However, that's not what other people are interested in in this painting, both in this show um, and and we also have um, we have an exhibition that of uh, of a of, of middle school uh, students uh, responding to some works in the show, and this is one of those that caught. Uh, some of the students' attention. But what we find there um, in this uh, quite wonderful uh, juxtaposition that's around the corner um, of, a, uh, of, of a portrait that was done, um, what seems to be of, I don't know, a quite poor man, in any case, a kind of very, or, a, a person who's simply leaning against the wall uh, around, the, around the corner here. And what he's picked up on, the artist picked up on, um, is, is quite striking and made me go back and look at this painting again. And that is on his sense of interior life. You know, but for all his wealth, seeming well, that there is a sense of kind of ambiguity in the facial expression. You know, where am I now? Where am I going? Where have I been? You know? Um, that's a, a, a very, uh, that once I see this, I'm riveted by it. Um, and that this um, a pattern of no matter what the status is, of, of there's some sort of inward examination uh, taking place uh, here um, is uh, uh, really very moving. Um, the Alessandro uh, de' Medici, the Duke of Florence, uh, the, uh, according to uh, contemporary uh, critics, um, his mother was a black slave uh, from one of the Medici households. His father, on the other hand, um, is even more problematic. Um, his uh, father uh, was almost certainly um, later to become Pope Clement VII. He's also a, a Medici. So this is. <laughs> it's a complicated back family. Um, so it's very interesting for somebody who becomes a Duke that we don't have a clear birthday for this man. Well, of course, no one wants to admit where he was even born. So you'll have, you know, so so we'll say, oh, well, I think he was born in a brief or vino, which would be also a, 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 a far from Florence, but another sort of Medici. Uh, family uh, sort of stronghold there. Well, almost surely not, but if he's born in Urbino, somehow you could explain, wow, well, we don't actually have the day. Um, <laughs> in any case, uh, um, once he had died, he was a really a tyrant. He was really a piece of work. We, we have to tell the truth on this. He's assassinated in 1537. After he's assassinated, then historians and others feel more comfortable about commenting on him. <laughs> At which point, not only does one historian who has known him in life describe him as black, which they had not dared to do during his lifetime, um, uh, but also we have this portrait, which is in the show, which is fabulous by a very important artist. His name's Bronzino. But this portrait has always been disregarded because it was said, oh, well, it was done after his life. And after his death, it can't be from you know, life. But the point is, all the portraits during his life are all ones that he commissioned. Well, they are what we today would call airbrushed. <laughs> At least that's how I see them. Um, I have had really very serious disagreements with some of my colleagues about some of these who feel they, in other words, that a portrait, as a general principle, if you have one work of art that is very precisely done and another one that is very loosely done so that you can hardly see the detail, you can't go from loose to precise, you know? You're not going to have a precise copy of a loose painting. Because, you know, um, you go the other way. So these other portraits are very, very loose. Or also he has a black, he has a cap on. Or it's suddenly, you know, sort of in deep shadow or something like that. Or it's just everything's painted in ways that are not characteristic for the artist. So 
So this, because it was later, they said, well, this can't be you know, a good document. And it's never been on view. But to my mind, it's part of a series of family portraits. They're small, they're for family, sort of family record. But this is the key document because we know that he had access to a very good drawing from life you know, that was done during his lifetime. So now he has nothing to fear. Why not just depict him as he is? So this portrait, which was done after Alessandro's death, in my view, is the authentic uh, image, at which point, um, for those who, scholars who say there is no evidence that he um, had any African ancestry, I would say, you know, here, can, can we just close the issue? <laughs> can we just close that? Um, and which he now hangs next to our portrait, by Pontormo, who's another very good portrait of the time. And here we have Maria Salviati, who's a member of the um, Medici family. Um, and this is her ward, not her, her own child, it's her ward, Giulia de Medici. Giulia is his illegitimate daughter. Now, <laughs> It's a really fascinating story, and when you are in the show, um, you will go to the resource center, and there you will see a whole discussion of the painting, was at one point the child was painted out. And you will see a discussion of that. It's not maybe what you think, it's maybe not what you think. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> um, but everyone, my, my colleagues will also say, there is no evidence that this is this man's daughter. Uh, now, and so that she doesn't look like him at all. This is a white child. I was like, okay, they're hanging next to each other. Please. <laughs> so, the, the show is meant to do in many ways is that they're. Um, uh, to, to kind of gently, gently take many people by the hand, as it were, um, and help them to see, uh, to, to see this African presence in Renaissance Europe, sort of step by step. Um, but here we have a real question of self-representation. You know, how he's wearing a bit of sort of armor, he wants to be a military, he's showing himself as a military man, okay? How do you, you how do you present yourself? Here's a, just a detail of a little medal he commissioned uh, during his life, probably the one that she's holding here. And um, he makes himself look like a Roman emperor. So the hair changes character considerably. Um, so it's very interesting to see all the different ways that people um, manipulated their, their imagery. Uh, one of the uh, striking set of images of that character um, has to do then with the section on diplomats and rulers. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really struck as I'm you know, here thinking of around the room here, um, even from what I can see here, um, on all the different ways that uh, the artists in this show have played off the issue of both conformity um, and, um, uh, and, and difference. Uh, and uh, here we, we see this coming out quite strikingly also because diplomats, there, there were a lot of African diplomats in Europe. We have already, in the 1480s, is the first royal embassy from the Congo uh, to come to Lisbon in 1484. Um, and you have a, a whole series of them, um, the, the Congo, Ethiopia, um, Tunisia, um, Morocco, and, and Egypt are the countries in which you have the most active um, uh, diplomatic uh, engagement, trade relations, negotiations, uh, etc., uh, uh, taking place. Now, on the other hand, so diplomats came to Europe. Um, they could commission portraits uh, while they were there. Um, they could define themselves any old way they wanted. You know? They're very high status figures. And when they, their presence in Europe, obviously, um, should I be using this or yes, 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 yes. Oh, oh, recording. Oh, I see, I see, I see. I usually think people can hear me uh, uh, well enough. Um, 
uh, their presence uh, would have an outside impact on people's, you know, of, of uh, white Europeans' concept of Africa because they uh, were such high status and so public, public um, in their in their presence. But you would also have people of African ancestry, rulers, uh, who did not come to Europe, uh, but who, one way or the other, they either sent their portraits to Europe. Um, or uh, portraits of them were commissioned uh, for European collections. And it's very interesting uh, to see these because we see then the beginning of, of, of really this assertion of cultural difference in a, in a, very, interesting, uh, a very interesting way. Um, on the uh, screen uh, here, uh, for example, uh, these two portraits right here, both of uh, monarchs uh, of Africa, uh, whose uh, portraits were commissioned uh, for the great collection of portraits of famous men and women for the Medici, again, the Medici family um, in uh, Florence. Uh, and you have, this is the Sultan of Egypt, um, which is um, included uh, partly uh, to remind us that certainly in the Renaissance they were very aware that Africa was a multi-ethnic society. You know that that and and so the um, sultans of uh, of of Egypt uh, were functionally white. Uh, they were almost all. Um, it's a sort of curious situation in in Egypt, the Mamluk uh, dynasty, in that the only way to become sultan, what Mamluk means, it's not a family name. It means basically purchased. Um, you can only become sultan if, in fact, you had been first a slave. Mm -hmm. um, and they were white slaves from the east, again, these eastern, eastern slaves. So they went out and purchased a cohort of boys, um, uh, usually Christian. Uh, then they are forcibly uh, turned into Muslims, uh, raised to be a military elite. And from there, um, from that cohort, uh, one would be chosen uh, to become uh, the Sultan. So then in fact, if you were an ordinary, maybe wealthy, maybe very successful um, uh, Egyptian, uh, you had no chance of becoming Sultan. A couple of Sultans tried to um, uh, put their sons in place after them, but no such, no such luck. So it's a, it's a quite curious um, uh, system. Uh, but in any case, the other one that we have here um, is Dawit III. Dawit, um, Emperor of Ethiopia, um, is one of the um, most important uh, individual figures um, in this whole exhibition uh, because of the prominence of Ethiopia in the European imagination. Um, the antiquity of the uh, Christian church in Ethiopia was well known in Europe and of course was the uh, subject of great admiration. Uh, the, uh, already by 1500, um, in Italian libraries, they were collecting Ethiopian manuscripts. And it was the beginning of a kind of almost area of studies um, in, in Europe. The, the Ethiopian studies really starts um, in the, uh, in the 15, 1500s. But Dawit himself, who had the correspondence with the king of, of Portugal and also with the uh, pope, um, was seen as a, uh, one of the uh, great Christian uh, uh, rulers uh, of the time. Um, and um, <clears throat> so he plays a, an important role, place in this show. Uh, we also have then this remarkable painting in terms of then presentation. Um, this painting was executed in Ecuador, mm. which will be a little bit surprising to people. Um, but it is from the end of the 16th century, and this is Don, Fresh, Don Francesco de Arabe. We know who he is. He nicely put his name on here, along with his sons. Um, and this painting, uh, he is the headman of a community of escaped African slaves who have um, established their own uh, societies, um, uh, intermingled and intermarried, formed uh, uh, societies with uh, Indian uh, communities uh, there. Um, and he has um, uh, uh, begun an inter a, a diplomatic initiative to the king of Spain, who is after the conquest, they are now, Spain is now rules uh, much of South America, um, wanting his two sons confirmed as his successors. So he sends a port, they send a portrait of him along with this diplomatic initiative 
in order to give, obviously, a kind of substance um, and presence uh, to this, um, uh, to this uh, uh, request. It's an absolutely, it's a great big painting. It's, it's absolutely sort of remarkable. Um, here this man, these people of African uh, origin here, um, how have they presented themselves uh, at this moment of sort of really Im important diplomatic uh, moment for them? Um, first of all, one of the things that you will notice, and more when you see the painting in the flesh, is that they have chosen that some aspects of Europe, first of all, they've used a European form, um, so that that will be easily recognizable uh, to the King of Spain. But the costume, first of all, the collar, that collar, starched, um, um, iron collar, that's not very comfortable to wear. Nobody chooses that um, or, or just uh, for its uh, comfort. Um, so here they are defining themselves by a specific aspect of European uh, of custom, sort of framing the face uh, with this. So in other words, to, to, to be acceptable, to, to fit in with the court culture, with decorum. But at the same time, what's this jewelry? What's this jewelry? Gold jewelry. This is not European jewelry. It's not African jewelry either. If you can imagine um, that if you, oh, I'm stepping along over the line um, here. Do you know where the word deadline comes from? <laughs> no, do you know where the word deadline comes from? No, um, I think I'm right in saying this because I think of that every time I think of a, a, a line um, at, um, the, at Andersonville Prison during the Civil War in, in um, somewhere in the South where Union soldiers, were, they didn't really have fences. I mean, they didn't have any money for fences. Where, and this is, you know, and so there is a line drawn. And if you step over it, you're shot. <laughs> so I always think of that when I'm trying to, I've got a deadline. <laughs> Um, in any case, you can imagine that if somebody has been forcibly brought from Africa to South America as a slave, you're not bringing any jewelry. Right. You know? Or if you had it, it's long gone. It's been right. confiscated. So there isn't any question of their bringing African, you know, their own. However, just, I don't know if anybody would recognize this. Um, we installed, I installed, put, hung some similar pieces uh, with this in the show. Uh, this is very, very high status jewelry. It's very iconographically potent in this painting. But what it is, is um, local Indian culture. This is American, early, um, pre-conquest, pre-Columbian, in other words, um, of culture uh, of only more very high status figures. So it's really, it's, it's really in this context quite in your face. Um, so it's both, you know, being very decorous, accommodating, but at the same time, we are our own people. Our society, in point of fact, is older than yours. Um, so, but in any case, it's pre-Spanish conquest, you know? So they're, they're defining themselves um, in terms of a long, ongoing, you know, sort of a successful society um, in, a, in a very, very interesting uh, way to me, which is just one of those questions that comes out so often, you know, through, throughout this, without being specifically um, of, of commenting on these in a kind of direct way of how do we choose to define ourselves? Uh, the last um, uh, image in the show I have to show because he is in the front here of, of the front. Um, yes. I, I consider this as a kind of validation of the whole effort. Um, uh, we finished the show uh, with Benedict, uh, the Moor. Um, uh, some of you will know Benedict because he is uh, a black saint uh, from the 16th century. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, um, the, why didn't we have him at the end of the show? Why didn't we have him in the section on Christian art? Or why didn't we have him in the sense of a free 
um, but with free, free uh, 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 people of African ancestry. Well, that's because um, I was trying to be really a stickler for documentation because I didn't want anybody to say, well, I don't believe you because the image that you're using isn't actually from the Renaissance. Um, and from his lifetime, because he's, he's a poor Franciscan, um, he's a poor hermitage during his lifetime um, in, in Sicily, and there aren't any portraits of poor Franciscans uh, from this uh, period. Um, I mean, there were uh, quite a number of black Franciscans at this period. We don't have any portraits of any of the other ones uh, either. Um, but we did have, you know, almost immediately or, or, or before his death, his sanctity was so obvious to everyone around him um, that he was um, being paid an extraordinary amount of attention that, that really almost embarrassed him during his lifetime and was beginning to be revered slush. Soon, soon thereafter. Um, indeed, by 1611, when those little factoids that my head is full of, um, uh, his, um, uh, where he is, uh, was buried, they had to, they were going to have to move his bones, and they didn't have um, a good way to do this. So the king of Spain uh, donated money for a silver casket. Mm. Not bad. Um, um, but in any case, uh, he was beatified in the 18th century. Uh, I mean, by then it was so obvious that there were so many um, uh, groups that were devoted to his uh, reference throughout um, Spain and Portugal and, and Sicily. Um, uh, it was sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of acknowledging a fait accompli almost by that time. But um, so um, in the camp during the campaign leading up to his uh, his beatification, there are a number of absolutely stellar works that were created. So I could get one of those, you know, um, which I couldn't get anything from his lifetime. So uh, trying to be, you know, <laughs> in a museum you're always trying to sort of, okay, I've got reality and here's the story I want to tell and they don't quite fit. So I even have to massage the story uh, just a little bit to make it work. So I put him at the end and said, okay, this is the ongoing story, which it is, of course. Um, but it's telling a slightly different story than I might have told originally if I'd had a 16th century image of him. So he was uh, finally canonized in 1807. So by putting this, this this great, beautiful polychrome uh, statue with this absolutely piercing uh, gaze, will not let you leave the show without thinking about him. Um, uh, to conclude, uh, with this uh, sense that uh, the um, presence uh, that we had established in the show, or this play, now being somewhat enlightened by one of these artists here on this play of absence and, and, and presence, um, is the beginning uh, of an ongoing story. Um, and uh, as some of you will be aware, um, there are churches all over North America, as well as the rest of them, you know, in Europe and in South America, uh, dedicated to uh, Benedict the Moor so that he continues uh, to inspire today. And since, um, and so I think on that note, uh, since I have been so inspired um, uh, in thinking about this by, by many of the works um, uh, presented here, um, I will stop and <laughs> see if you all have some questions. saw the show before Andrew. Oh, anyway, right. My question is, I guess it's a general question on curating. With works this rare, how do you go about finding them? Ah, uh, um, uh, with perseverance. Um, I've been sort of building up a, um, you know, sort of looking for things for, for years, but there are also other scholars who have been, there's a, there's a project uh, that started many years ago in Houston at the Menil Foundation. Um, and that now is housed uh, in the Du Bois Institute at Harvard, oh yes, at Harvard, um, uh, run by Henry Louis Gates. It's called The Image of the Black in Western Art. Okay? Um, and they have, uh, they have an archive. I must say there are lots of works in the show that are not in their archive and not known to them. But in any case, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm part of that. I'm a contributor to, to, their, to Gates' publication. So, um, 
Uh, so th there are a variety of, of sources, but I was also looking for things that were unknown, yeah. you know, uh, like our poster girl, completely unknown, unpublished uh, before this show, or that wealthy man, completely un mm. un unpublished. Uh, we had a lot of financial um, restraints on it, so that there are a number of works that would also have been unknown, I would like to have uh, included in the show, uh, that may be in some cases illustrated in the catalog, but we just didn't have the money. Um, I, I don't think people realize sometimes how expensive uh, loans uh, from Europe, especially from a distance, can be. Uh, there's one famous painting by uh, the Italian uh, patriotician um, that had been promised to us from a private collection. Um, that that um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of... Um, uh, it, it's, it's the first picture to show. It's a picture of the Titian that shows uh, the uh, very beautifully dressed woman with a black uh, 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 servant, little boy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cute kid in this um, e elaborate silk. Um, uh, I have to call it costume because it's not what people normally wore. Um, in any case, that painting was promised to us. I went to the private collector. He quizzed me for six hours. Um, I finally agreed to lend the painting, but then when it came time to negotiate transportation, turns out he had so many requirements that it was going to cost $60,000 for one painting. Now, that's far beyond. There are lots of exhibitions, whole exhibitions people do that cost. Uh, less than less than less than that. So so um, so it's tough at that point. Um, the director had placed it. Said, okay, you can have X number of, you know, European loans, and that's that's it. Uh, so we just tried to organize. There were other things that were promised to us, uh, but we just couldn't follow up on it because there was nothing nothing to be so done. So you have you're part of the Henry Gates project, right? you have ideas about where to look for things, or is there a repository? Well, I, it, it, there, is a, there, there is a photo archive, yes. Oh, okay. um, but, but I found that it's sometimes far better just to do my own, uh, own work, because you come up with a different, you know, you're looking for certain things, you're looking for certain patterns. Um, and uh, see, the thing is, not only to, to find an image of something, it's got to be borrowable, <laughs> which is a, often a totally different question. It's one of those things that's a big difference between doing an exhibition and a book. The mm -hmm. book, all you need is the photo rights. Mm -hmm. But if it's an exhibition, you've got to be able to borrow it. You know, so there are all kinds of issues that have to condition, you know, uh, everything, or they just don't like your project or, or, or whatever that can happen. Uh, with, they, they have to feel that they're, um, we, we, had, um, we had only one case uh, where there was a question about the project. Uh, but other than that, everybody was very enthusiastic about the uh, project. And we have, for instance, uh, five works of art from the Uffizi. From, from Florence, so that was, you know, they were very, very generous because some of those works have not left, you know, the Uffizi before. <laughs> yes. I have a question right here. Oh. Good afternoon. I'm very grateful for your enthusiasm. I have a question about a portrait of the Negress. Which are you? If you're not familiar with it, well, then you don't need to go any further well, with the bad there, there, I mean, um, that's not a term we usually use today. Um, in the museum, but um, I'm not sure. You, you, there are so many pictures um, that depict a, a black woman that I'm not sure what it's you're from, it's, it's a painting called The Portrait of a Negress. By? It's in, uh, it's it's in Louis. 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 It's, a, it's Marie. I can't pronounce the second name, but the last name is Van Wiest. B E N O I S T. Oh, women. From uh, B -B? Paris. B E N O I S T. If you're unfamiliar okay. with that, okay. yeah, it's, it's later than my, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be very honest. Once you get out of my period, um, there are a lot of things I don't know. Yeah. Is it Louise Marie Therese? Louise Marie Therese? That one? I don't know. I am going to be unable to attend your talk on December 6th on the Black Egyptian across Haiti. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, can you just give us like a couple minutes about that? Uh, do you know that painting? There's a painting in this show 
um, in the Christian art um, uh, section. Uh, that's a painting from our collection that has never been on view before. Um, it's actually, is it the supper? The supper. The supper, the supper? Yes. It's it's actually, there's a small little image. You were going to say you had it? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one. Oh, oh yes, yes, okay, yes, here. yes. Oh, okay. So okay. there's oh, a little thumbnail. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, that painting, uh, you're, I'm hoping you're familiar with the, um, the story of the supper at Emmaus. You know, Christ, after his death, yeah. he reappears to some of his apostles, um, as he said he would do. And um, he's, uh, two of his apostles are walking along this dusty road, and a stranger comes up and said, oh, I'll just walk along with you. And so the three of them, this is an interesting guy, and, and he has interesting mm -hmm. views, so they walk along sort of together, and they get close to this little town of Emmaus, and they said, well, I think we're going to stop you know, here for the night, and they do you want to have dinner with us? He says, okay, fine. So, so they go to, to the inn to have uh, dinner with them, and so they sit down at the table. The innkeeper gets them a table, um, and, and, and usually you, you see the three of them sitting to the table. The two, the two apostles, usually it's like a table like this, it's usually represented, and you'll have an apostle on either side, and you'll have the stranger here sort of sitting in the middle, and maybe the innkeeper is shown because he's coming in to bring them some food or, or, or something like that. But by the time, but in the, and, and, and it's at that moment when, um, when the stranger then breaks the bread, mm -hmm. that they, realize. They're, they're, the, the veil, as it were, falls from their eyes and they realize that it's Christ mm -hmm. who has come back. Mm -hmm. um, and by the 16th century, because by the 16th century in European art, you know, we think of the, the signal importance of art um, as a devotional aid at this period, to help people with their imagination to understand, give them a sense of reality to events. And it's happening like in your own time. And it's not just something that happened a long time ago. Um, but by this period, you are often finding that artists are beginning to uh, respond to the contemporary feeling, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's not just in terms of um, a greater sense of the presence of people of African ancestry and Christian art, but a wider sense of what constitutes society. Mm -hmm. um, and an interest in um, uh, uh, people of all sort of levels of society, of, of farmers, you know, that you actually care about rural people and they begin to appear in art, you know, as themselves and not as an object just of humor because you're so klutzy and uneducated. You know, it's, it's just a complete open, uh, an expansion, a slow expansion of the idea of, of the social compact. Um, and as a reflection of that, in Christian art, you begin to see more and more of entering in, when you depict a, a, an important subject like that, of including sometimes other people who aren't necessarily described in the <coughs> Bible, uh, Bible story. Um, and um, so the suffering Emmaus sometimes begins to have other people. Uh, depicted it because Christ is always it makes a big point in the Bible of his uh, of his um, uh, often uh, surprising his followers uh, by uh, wanting to talk and sort of converse and draw in uh, all kinds of people. He just wanted to expand the mission, expand the mission. So okay, in this painting there is a black man. Who is this black man? What is his role? Well. Um, uh, if, uh, we, we don't have a picture here, and I don't, I don't want to somehow kill the, the, the punchline um, uh, here a bit. But I will tell you that there, is a big, there was a big tussle inside the Walters uh, on who this black man uh, is. Is he a servant, or is he seated at Christ's right hand? That's a big difference. That's a big difference. Um, you might, wh what is the talk called? Is it, the talk is, um, like I said, it's called just, uh, the Supper at a Yeah. The Black Egyptian at Crisis. Oh, okay, okay, so I've sort of given it away there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my view is, to, to my view, if you, if you know what a contemporary person who lived in Venice would know at that time, there can be no question. He is not a servant. 
He is an Egyptian military officer. And if you are an Egyptian military officer of, of a type that would be commonly seen in Venice, because there were so often um, you know, some kind of delegation, a trade delegation, who knows what, um, in Venice, which are frequently accompanied by a military convention. It happens today, you know, that there's, um, and um, so uh, people in Venice would not make that mistake. You know? So, uh, in, in point of fact, all the arguments that the people say, wow, he's passing something or whatever. Yeah, you know, did you ever pass something to somebody sitting next to you in the cake? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say thank you for undertaking this huge undertaking. I'm always interested in knowing what motivates people? What motivates you to do this? This is uh, uh, a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah well, um, uh, yes. Well, that's a kind of long story in, in some ways. Um, there are a couple of things. Just you, you might say, first of all, um, it's a side of the, the, the Renaissance is a very rich period. You know, because here you have this age of exploration um, and this new uh, mental attitude of, of focusing on the, the, the individual. So many things happening at that time and so much new forms of art being created that it's just, I'm always looking for a new aspect of the Renaissance, you know. So, so there's that side. But there are, after all, other sides to the Renaissance that I could have chosen um, for this. And I guess um, I, I will tell you a tiny bit about myself um, here. And the, the, the first thing I there, I think because of thinking about um, uh, why you see, you know, there, there's so many things that you can see. Why do you see one thing and, and not another thing, you know? Um, and, and we find that all the time in our lives, that, that one person, you know, it's a, it's a typical story in an accident. And, and t 10 people may have been there and you'll have 10 stories mm -hmm. because they all are seeing something different because there, there's something from their own background or frame of reference that's seeing something uh, uh, different there or they're, they're responding to one person's side of the story, mm -hmm. you know, or something because they feel like, okay, I've been there or, or, or something. Um, and uh, uh, I um, was, uh, when I was in the um, uh, eighth grade, um, the, I lived in North Carolina, and the way the system of schools worked, then it was one to seven, and then eight to twelve. We didn't have a middle school. And I went to R.J. Reynolds High School, which was not a name that will mean anything. I think to probably anything. Cigarettes. It means something. The tobacco. The cigarette people. What? The cigarettes. Oh, that, yes, the cigarettes. Yes, but but there's. Forget the cigarettes. Um, <laughs> Um, I was a student. I was a student. Excuse me. Where's the sale? That's where I'm from. Oh, oh. Well, <laughs> well um, while I was a student there, we were integrated, and that was the first school in North Carolina to be integrated. And integration meant one black girl and two thousand white students. Um, we had moved there from the north. Not too long thereafter, we moved back north again. Because uh, my father was sort of, the, sort of corporate and they moved people uh, around. And I never, um, so I was quite, I, I have to say, marginally paralyzed uh, by this experience because I really, I, I was trying to get a grip on what it was about and it's not something you could discuss. Mm -hmm. Nobody discussed these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought that I would, she wasn't in the same year that I was in, that eventually I would run into her or pass her in the hall. And, you know, this is, I, I, I'm telling you, you know, it sounds silly, but when you're 12, when you're 13, you, you, your imagination doesn't run very large. And I was so skinny and so tall. Yes, I was actually skinny at one point. <laughs> um, and I was so preoccupied with not being cool you know, or, or, or whatever, and um, so all I could really imagine to do is that I would say hi, you know, that I would just be natural, normal. I never saw her. She graduated, you know, I moved north, and I never saw her, but that stuck with me, that I had never said hi. Fast forward 
30 years later about, I finally tracked her down. Really? To say hi. <laughs> um, it took me quite a while. Um, and it's very interesting that it was someone on the Walters board who helped, who knew her, which shows you how things change. It was one of our board members who was from Winston Salem, who I would never have known in Winston Salem. Uh, who I, I went to him once with, you know, that I had tried to, I'd, I'd even gone back, because then after a while, I, you know, after a couple of years, after I moved back north, I realized one point I had forgotten her name. So I've always had this thing about names and, and images. You'll find an empty frame in the show. Because, you know, if you lose the image of somebody or whatever, you, if you move, lose the identifier, you lose them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said, oh my God, I've forgotten her name. You know, you shouldn't forget somebody's name <laughs> like that. Well, I mean, somebody who's done something, done something. Um, and um, so for ages, I, I was busy with all kinds of other things and being a graduate student and, you know, living abroad and teaching in Canada and all kinds of stuff. But then I was going to come back to the States. And so, okay, all this sort of American juices started uh, running again. And I was trying to, I got something about a reunion in, in Winston-Salem. I thought, oh, I don't know if I can do that. You know, but I wrote to them, and I wrote to them, and there was these things about all the things that had happened when we were in high school. And I was thinking, gee, it's all about winning the high school, you know, state champion. And I said, you know, there was integration also. Um, and it wasn't part of the story at all, mm. you know, of what had happened when we were, and, and I was thinking, ooh, we live in different worlds. Um, and so I said, well, who was? What was the name? What was the name of the, the woman who integrated, or the girl then? And, and so somebody told her my, my name, because I had been looking, trying to find a newspaper, you know, from Winston-Salem, if I could find them online, you know, and I couldn't find anything. So this was great, and I had the name. But what was it going to do with the name? Because she had become quite reclusive. I mean, it really was very hard on her life, that, that period, as I later found out. So I wasn't getting anywhere, so I went to this, um, this board member. Um, and uh, he said, oh my goodness, he said, I went out with her sister. Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We're getting, we're making progress. <laughs> um, and so um, uh, it turned out that she actually lived in Maryland. Wow. wow. Mm. So I wrote to her, wrote to her again, wrote to her again. Over, and, and finally I got a response. I guess after I'd written to her a couple of different times that began to make an impression or something. So she finally agreed to meet. And uh, she uh, was not too keen on this. It was not bringing up good memories, you know, whatever. And, and I said, look, I, I, I just want to say one thing to you. You know, I just want to say that it made a difference. That's all, you know, that's, that's all I have. That's all I have. Um, is it making a difference? And I'm willing to bet statistically that out of that school, I cannot, it's just statistically impossible that I am the only student that it made a difference to. It's, it's statistically impossible. So there have to be uh, many, many more. So, um, you know, that's, that's all I have to say. You know, I'm, I, I don't have anything else. Uh, but I told her that I was working on this uh, project. Um, and uh, then um, we kind of, and she was very wary of, of me then. And, and then, but I always sort of remembered thereafter that she had one, one what was getting very difficult doing this project. And then I had have other sort of little things when I remember once, you know, all kinds of other little things would, uh, and, oh, at the time I remember having this, you know, the first time I ever had a, a, a real thought as a kid um, was, was at this time, it was my first experience of an actual thought, I think, <laughs> um, is that I was so preoccupied with being uncool. Um, my mother made me wear tie shoes. Oh, the horror of having to wear tie shoes when everybody else wore loafers. But one day a week I could wear loafers. <gasps> I was a normal <coughs> person on Friday. I remember that. I wore. And then I had this suddenly I this, I this inspiration I um, that I could take off my shoes. I could take off the tie shoes. And she couldn't take her color off. Mm. Mm. You know, and, 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 oh. 
Um, so, so that was, you know, those tie kind of shoes. You know, I, I always remember. So re, re, hmm? They weren't so bad. Mm -hmm. No, they weren't so bad. They they weren't so bad. But it was my first experience of of actually, um, you know, making an analogy. Yeah, to trying to yes, to actually on my own, as it were, as a kid, sort of seeing seeing something and thinking, okay, oh, you know, what, what, what do you do with that then? You know what? What do you do with that? Um, and um, so I'm, I'm sure um, that, and, and I was very struck by these issues of, of invisibility. You know, th these issues um, that if that if we don't talk about it, it's not there. Um, and there is uh, such a uh, quite aside from the historical issues, um, uh, uh, th there was a lot of what I would say um, pushback um, on this subject because I think a lot of uh, a lot of people, um, they would just assume it's more convenient if it's not talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. even today, it's much more convenient. Uh, but but uh, I'm not always so good at convenience. Um, uh, so so it, it, it just seems to me that you were getting what was a, a really good story that, that could have, should have been told a long time ago. Um, uh, and um, so, uh, so these issues, it was just generally of just a really good story, so and, and untold, but it was a story that would also have um, that would have resonance for a lot of people and would bring people into Renaissance art, since that's what I do, um, and see how wonderful it is, because um, we will see that it as a uh, as an art form um, uh, just express so many different subtleties about the society. Then, then people have realized you know, that you can see yourself um, in this art. And indeed, there are various people, at least two people um, in this show uh, that I know work in Baltimore. You know, which is, I mean, which is to say that there are, um, th there are two people in Baltimore uh, that when they, you know, when I showed them photographs of figures in the show, you know, it was them. You know, is that which is just a reminder, you know, that they're us. I mean, it's they're people, and so that was one of the reasons that I really wanted to focus on not image of somebody. I wanted to just talk about people. Um, so the idea that a work of art is not, or a painting is not a surface. Oh yes, it is. After all, it's a painting. It's a piece of something, but it's also a window. If you think of it as a window, and that we are looking forward back to 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 ask those people to to step out, you know, here. Speak to us. Yes, to speak to us exactly, exactly. To 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 speak to us, and and to do that, you um you all you have to do is suddenly suddenly like this project, um the Gates's project or started long before him of the image of the black and white. It's a lot of very interesting material in there. Uh, but I, I, I think it's far more compelling um, to um, think of that as a window on these people's lives. For, for me, it's much more compelling a uh, story. And, and just as an historian, it leads you to see things. You're always looking for a different perspective on some. You don't always have to look at exactly the same perspective. Let's look at other, uh, other, other perspectives. And this offers a, a different perspective that, in my view, um, is much more compelling. And, and also, you know, it, it works as an exhibition, you know, because you can, and, and we've been very careful in this show, or I was very careful in doing the label copy as, as well, to make very clear wherever possible that these issues are open, a lot of them. Um, because, I mean, even who is of African ancestry? Um, uh, you know, initially in the project, I got a lot of pushback on, on that, that you cannot talk, I had even funding institutions telling me, you cannot talk about appearance um, as a way of, of establishing whether somebody is of African ancestry. And I would say, well, I don't know, if we have no other record other than the work of art, I don't know how else to do this. And, and if the goal is to, um, because it, if the goal is to, in, fun, in fact, to establish patterns of achievement and, and contribution, then we have to go 
two depictions of high achievers, part of it is, and say, okay, can we tease out more information than we had before from an archival document? And I think we can. I, I think that there are many points in this show where if you start with this and say, okay, come on, come on, let, let's just, you know, let's just say what we all know. <laughs> that, that if you encountered this person in real life, you would automatically, somewhere in the back of your head, assume that the person was of African ancestry. Okay, this is a good thing. This is great. That this is a, is a step toward understanding um, uh, and find out what their contribution, what, what role did they play in the society? What were they? You know? Okay, now we've enlarged our, 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 our sense of, of uh, uh, the complexity uh, of society um, at this time. So, so anyway, so that's that's what I've been uh, that's what I've been doing. And I will say, I will say then I thought I'd lost sight of of uh, of Wendland, um, but um, I sent her a copy, and I thought I'd lost her address. But then at the last moment, I found it because she doesn't answer. She hasn't answered the telephone, in, you know. I think since high school. <laughs> I mean, I think it's just one of those ways, you know. Well, it's that a you trauma. Trauma. It's it's trauma. Exactly. Exactly. You're exactly. An exactly. 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 And so then I sent her a copy of the catalog and an invitation to the opening, and I said, "Please let me know if you decide to come." And I wasn't at all, you know, whether she would come or not. Anyway. So I didn't hear from her. And so then we had the opening, and it was quite sweet because um, um, uh, Representative Cummings uh, uh, spoke, and he was fabulous. Mm -hmm. He was fabulous, as he usually is. Um, and a professor from um, uh, 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 Hopkins, who's a contributor to the catalog, and this is diaspora expert, uh, spoke uh, also. And uh, so then um, I'm speaking, and I'm thanking a few people, and I, uh, I mentioned her, you know, as one of the inspirations for this project. And I said, I don't know if she's here or not, you know. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, sort of, Gwendolyn, are you here? Um, and uh, so the, the audience was very quiet, <laughs> very quiet at that moment. And um, and she raised her hand. Aww. She was there. Aww. She was there. <laughs> and, um, which was, you know, sort of overwhelming uh, uh, for me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I still didn't know whether she you know, how does she feel about all this? You know, you don't want to, you don't have to react like other people want you to react, you know? <laughs> it's, you, you, it's, you can't assume things. But I went over to talk to her after, uh, after the uh, uh, comments, and she was there with her daughter, um, and got uh, Cummings and, you know, Vincent to go on and talk to her, and, and, and she said, well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm really glad my daughter was here uh, mm -hmm. to see this. So then I figured, okay, it was okay. <laughs> it was okay. So she said also, when she saw that catalog, she said, okay, she actually did it. Excuse me. Not at the exhibit of death this great review to New York Times. <laughs> Is there any chance that it can travel beyond Princeton? Um, I, I would say not. Um, because first of all, you have to uh, um, you have to realize uh, that a lot of works of art cannot travel. It depends on what they're made of, etc. They can't travel more than a couple of venues uh, often. Um, the the second thing is uh, for a show to go after this one, it would have to be in the summertime, um, and uh, you normally do not do a show like this in the summertime because you're expecting on you know, university, school, a lot of interconnections, which simply for most museums don't happen in the summertime. And um, uh, for the uh, museums that would um, uh, naturally, might naturally like to have this, they frequently don't have the cash. I mean, I also I've had, you know, it's once, once something's open and everybody sees it, then the people who had all these fears beforehand suddenly you know, embrace it. So I had, we tried to place it in Europe, we tried to place it in England, um, and uh, one museum in Florence, they came, he, he came to, to see the show, and he, and the director says, oh, I didn't realize this was what you had in mind. I said, it's exactly what we described, you know? <laughs> 
So, yes, exactly. Exactly. Just hear it. Exactly. Hear it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's 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 absolutely true. So um so uh and, and also you know people schedule museums schedule things years out so you can't just it would mean reassemble. He says, oh well, we have to reassemble this in Europe. I said, okay, then mm -hmm. we have you know if you if you really want to do something like that, we have to start from scratch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of uh, over, over again um, because it takes. You know, you, you work years out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, on on these things because you've got a schedule mm -hmm. and you've got to apply for grants. I mean, it's the whole mm -hmm. you know, whole project. It's 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 a it's a very elaborate project, but it also is the problem. You can't do these shows in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, when does it go to Princeton? It it uh, we close the last day here is January twenty first, Martin Luther King Day. So bring everybody you know mm -hmm. before then. Um, and uh, then it opens mid-February in Princeton. Well, we'll have to let everybody know when they come for the inauguration. And we want them to see it here. <laughs> yes. Yes. So when they come for the inauguration, we'll make it a spot. Oh, what a good what idea. idea. What a good idea. That's a natural. What's a natural? Yes. Have well, you finished the catalog? Yes. Yes. Oh, 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 oh. May, may, I, may I say on this? Because, you see, because of... Uh, uh, our financial uh, uh, difficulties uh, at one point in this project, we did not print as many copies as perhaps we might have. So um, we are thinking of reprinting now. But what we need to know is, if you are planning to buy this, see, nice little publication, good at twenty-five dollars more. But if you, but if you are a member of the Walters, which it would be I'm nice. Not a member, but I oh. still want to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but what I, what I'm saying is, um, of course, if you're a member, you can take people for free any time. You can be the hostess or host, um, and also then you get a discount. On the catalog, but as it is, it's twenty-five dollars, which is not a bad price. So what I'm just saying to help us out, it would be a, a big help to us uh, to encourage those who have to do the reordering. That is what I'm encouraging. If you think you might get it for a Christmas present or other things for people, which you know, it's it's sort of priced to be quite possible for that sort of thing. The sooner, if you could order some of those now or whatever, because we need to have a sense. You see, of of what being sold, because otherwise, if you wait till Christmas, then there's no time for us to reprint. You see. Well, I want to ask you all to join me in thanking Dr. Spicer. And also, I want to say that thank you for making a difference for taking the Africans out of obscurity. But it's a great subject. Life. I mean, yes. you know, it's just a great subject. Yes, and thank you for just your years of commitment towards this exhibition. We greatly appreciate it. And also, I want to thank you for your partnership and collaboration with Gallery Martinez. Oh, well, this has been a pleasure. I say that this on behalf of Amy oh, as well. I, I've learned lots of things from this, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the last thing I'd like to know is that our next tea, excuse me for just a moment, our next tea with Ortiz, which was scheduled for December 8th, is not going to take place until January. Uh, we are going to be at Art Basel, Miami Beach, and one of our artists that is shared uh, with Amy is Maya Freelana Asante. She's being uh, debuted there, and so we all hope that you'll come down to Art Basel and join us there. Uh, Dr. Diala Torre's presentation, The Portrait of Louise Marie Therese, yeah. mm -hmm. The Royal Black Heiress Not To Be, is a fascinating story about the, her mother was the Queen of France, and you only guess who her father was. And so, she, it is Black Heiress, um, she became a nun. You do want to hear about her story. It's been rescheduled for January 18th, and you can now register because you know that our teas are being sold out very early on now. So I encourage you all to register online so we can anticipate the number of seating, the, the amount of seating that we need, and also um, so that we can feed you properly. And the last thing I want to thank Dr. Spicer 
digressing for a moment, is that she also wrote an essay for our catalog, which um, if you're interested in buying, please put your name on the list. It has not been printed yet. We have to get some more uh, permission for copyright uh, for imagery. So it's been a little bit postponed, but it's going to be a fascinating catalog. So if you're interested in the, the one that accompanies the, the Walters, then please let us know. But thanks again for your ongoing support of the gallery. We really appreciate that, and we hope you enjoy this afternoon. Thank you.